Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Global, for coming today. Um, my name is Megan Abella Bowen. I don't know if I've met any of you. I used to be the associate dean of the STEM programs over on the Fall River campus, and your instructor, um, Ms. Montero, has been a huge supporter of all the things that we have done over the years. I've even forced her to be on TV shows as a supporter of all things STEM. Um, so I appreciate that you folks have come over today and I appreciate that you walked over in the pouring rain because um, it is really coming down in buckets out there right now. Oh, um, so this morning um, you are here and you've been invited to be part of our health sciences panel. These are panels to really, they're designed for you folks in mind because so many times there are jobs and careers out there that you may not know about. If they're not on television, if they're not a, you know, if it's not a lawyer, if it's not a doctor, if it's not um, nurses, you don't typically hear about them on a regular basis, but yet there's great opportunities, they're fun jobs, they're jobs that you can actually do right down here in the South Coast and make good money doing it. So we're highlighting that for you folks today. This is also designed, and because we're such a small group, we really want to make it as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, I mean, we want to kind of keep it going because we do also plan after the panel, we're going to break you up into two smaller groups. Half of you will go over with our um, OTA, which is Occupational Therapy Assisting um, Faculty, and you're going to do some hands-on things. You're going to learn about what do you do as an OTA and get some experience in that. And the other half of you are going to go with Professor Hiller, and you're going to do clinical lab science activities and phlebotomy activities. So you're going to get to see what that's all about. And again, ask as many questions as possible. These folks are happy to answer them. What's phlebotomy? Ooh. We'll get there. Okay. We're going to go <laughs> that, 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 that side of the table, right over there. So we're going to go through all of that here in just a couple of minutes. But just a couple of quick things. Um, so again, we have three wonderful panelists today. You have a bio about them on your table, so you can ask questions based on that. Um, we're going to go starting off. Each of them will talk for about <coughs> 10 minutes during their time. Again, if you have a burning question, we've got time today. So you'll just raise your hand, and we'll be happy to answer that question so that you don't lose that question down the road. But also, afterwards, we'll take some more time for everybody to just ask general questions. Or if you're a little more shy, we'll have a little bit of time that you can come up and talk with them one on one so that you don't have to feel like you have to throw that question out there. But the reality is that if you have the question, there are probably other students sitting here who also have a similar question. And there really is no question that is not a good question. Because if you don't have information, you don't know you don't know things, and so this is a great opportunity to obtain that kind of information. Now, for you folks, what year are you? Are you juniors, seniors, juniors, juniors and sophomores? I'm a sophomore. And sophomores. Okay. So great. So you also have some time to think about opportunities. I know Global does a really good job of doing dual enrollment with us. So I know some of you do dual enrollment as a group, but you could also explore if there were some dual enrollment options that you might want to do as a um, on your own because you find there's a class that sounds really interesting to you. And we can certainly work with you. And um, who's who does dual enrollment? Ms. McPherson. Thank you. I was like stuck on the name there. So uh -huh. and Ms. McPherson would certainly help you with that as well. Um, and then finally, there I will let uh, Ms. McPherson and Ms. Montero know we are going to have some STEM starter classes going on at the new at the Fall River campus this coming summer. Um, for those of you who are juniors going on to your senior year, that might be a great opportunity for you to take a course in the summertime if that was something of interest to you. I know several of the global students in the past have taken our Bio 121 course um, and have also taken some of our math courses during the summertime. So I'll get that information to Ms. Montero uh, later on next week. So with that, I don't want to hold things up. So we have a panel today. Our first panelist is going to be, I'm my own. Our first panelist today is Amanda DaCosta. And Amanda DaCosta is a student here at Bristol and she is going to be finishing up her phlebotomy certificate. So she's going to tell you all about phlebotomy. Oh, nope. oh I'm sorry. Um, okay, so my name is Amanda DaCosta. Um, I took the phlebotomy certificate program in 2015. So I finished through the phlebotomy certificate program and I went on and I got my ASCP certification. Um, what is phlebotomy? You draw blood and you also do specimen processing, which means all of the blood that comes out from doctor's offices, you receive it into your hospitals if you work in a hospital. Um, you also help 
give instructions for urinalysis. When you give your cup and you're asked to go in the bathroom, I tell you what to do with whatever you get to do it. Um, so I started as a phlebotomist, and that was because I wanted to get into the medical field, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So phlebotomy is a really good way to start as either nursing or even medical lab science. So as a nurse, you're gonna be putting in IVs, you're gonna be drawing blood sometimes. You'll also get a better understanding of the lab as a phlebotomist. So I worked at St. Luke's for two years. Um, I drew blood on the floors. And during that time, how I figured out that I wanted to do clinical lab, I took the phlebotomy program with Professor Hiller. So she also put the bug in my ear that, oh, you should do medical lab science. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but I wasn't sure that I wanted to go back for a two-year program. So while I was at St. Luke's, um, they asked me to do lab assisting in the chemistry department, which I sorted all the specimens from outreach. I put the specimens on the machines. I took them off the machines. I'd pour off aliquots. I'd get specimens ready for send out. Um, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved it more than being on the floor. And I was like, you know what? I think I should go back to school and do lab. But it would have also been a really good opportunity if I wanted to do nursing. I could have found that out that way too because there's a lot of hands-on patient care. And what you do on the floor and how you draw your specimens matters. It affects patient results. So learning that and finding out how it worked helped me make the decision. So I came back and I applied for the medical lab science program and I'm graduating this spring in three weeks. So, um, thank you. Um, so I feel like the phlebotomy program is kind of overlooked, but it shouldn't be because it's a really good, it's a really good like career if that's what you wanted to make it. It's also a really good entry level career where you start out and you can go anywhere you want inside that hospital. You can go into nursing, you can go into lab, and no matter what you decide to do, you're gonna be better at your job because you started as a phlebotomist. And 70% of medical decisions are based on lab results. So 70% of what your doctor decides to do with what you have or whatever you're sick from is based on the blood that was drawn by a phlebotomist. So, my job was important, I understood that. I also understood that you can really hurt people. So having compassion for another person, taking care of another person, I figured out that wasn't for me. I don't like nursing, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm glad that I took it because I got to see the lab and that's where I feel like I flourished. So um, what do I love about being a phlebotomist? It's a rewarding job, I loved that you leave the room and you've interacted with somebody who's not having their best day and you in any way even though you're drawing their blood and they don't like that <laughs> if you are a decent human being they will be you know they're not happy that you're drawing their blood but they never I never had a bad experience where anybody was angry so I feel like phlebotomy is critical in patient care and I feel like it's a really good way to start in the medical field. I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit about your jobs after when you did the phlebotomy? What did you do? Um, how hard was it to find a job? And oh, you... no. Um, when I finished the phlebotomy, I did the summer hybrid course, which was, what is that, seven weeks? It's six weeks for one class, seven weeks for okay. the second class. So it was over the summer, and it was Wednesday nights. So it was five to eight. And <coughs> I finished in September with the clinical rotation, which you, you do three weeks out at a clinical site and you work full time for, you just practice. And I was hired in January. So and that's only because HR took a little while, <laughs> but mostly, and even after I was hired at St. Luke's, I was still getting phone calls. I'm still getting calls from other places like, hey, you wanna come in? Phlebotomy is, it is always open. There are always positions. I think if you go on St. Luke's, there's like nine positions right now. Wow. So, yeah, there are positions. And then even after that, for medical lab science, I was offered three positions already. I took one because why not? But three positions, I'm, I'm not even graduated. So, yeah, there are positions. There is work. So. And then can you give them just a little bit of what does the class look like? And who are you practicing on? How are you getting all that experience? Okay, you practice on each other. 
You. <laughs> yep. There are artificial Under arms. Supervision. <laughs> she. Saying. You know what? The first draw, you're nervous. You're. I remember being so nervous that I almost didn't even come. <laughs> <laughs> We practiced on artificial arms, and the, the, she's like, next week, <coughs> each other. And I got blood. I remember that. I remember getting blood, and I was so amped. And it's a little scary, but it's strangely satisfying. <laughs> 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 Being good at what you do is satisfying. So, yeah, you practice on each other, and it's not, you know, all night. You're not just poking each other's arms. <laughs> it's one poke. Well, in the summer hybrid, it's one poke in each arm. If you did the fall semester, it's one poke in one arm. So, and sh she's not letting them probe you or anything. You don't get blood. She act, she makes them act like they did. Just put the tubes on, act like you got blood. And then, even though that's disheartening that you don't get blood, sometimes you don't on the first time, you will. <laughs> so, it's you're learning. That's all it is. So, yeah. And the last thing is, would you say it's a really hands-on type of applied class? So yes. if a learner really wants to be in that kind of an environment? Oh, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. She's very good in that. She lets you, the artificial arms. Um, I was the SI, like the supplemental instructor for the class over the summer. So she, she was able to be in the lab while they were drawing from each other. And I was out in the classroom and letting them practice on the artificial arms. So they could practice on the artificial arms for almost as long as they'd like to as much practice as they needed and then if anybody felt that they needed more practice on an artificial arm she would make sure that they had time so i had plenty of practice when i was done i was ready to just start getting paid to do it <laughs> i never went out feeling like i wasn't getting enough experience so do any of you folks have specific questions Thing you want to know more about Professor Hiller? Will they be seeing that arm when they go into your? Oh yeah, oh, I yeah. have many Ooh. arms. <laughs> many <laughs> arms. Can we, like, can we learn how to do? Why not? Let's be in that lab. All right. <laughs> so our next speaker is Stacy News, and Stacy is in our. Oh, um, I'm just going to read it off here so I don't make the same mistake I just did a second ago. So Stacy recently graduated from Bristol Community College with her associate's uh, science degree in occupational therapy assistance, and she holds a national certification in OTA and is licensed to practice in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. She's passionate about the field of occupational therapy and helping individuals get back to doing things that are meaningful to them. Um, she has received quite a few accolades since being here at the college, so she'll kind of talk a little bit about that. But mostly, I want her to talk about, again, her path, what drew her into OTA, I'm sure. How many of you have ever even heard of occupational therapy assistance? Okay, so cool. you, but it's, it's one of those jobs that a lot of people don't know about, but there's a lot of opportunity. So Stacy will talk a little bit about that. Great. So I'm Stacy, and um, like she said a little bit, like what occupational therapist, so you can be an occupational therapist, which is a little bit more schooling, or you can become an occupational therapy assistant, which is currently a two-year program, or sometimes you can go to a four-year school and also you would get a CODA um, they call it a Certified Occupational Therapy Assistant degree. Um, and that is you out there helping individuals get back to doing things that are meaningful to them. So do people in here play any sports or have any, um, play musical instruments or have things that they like to do in their free time? And if something were to happen in your life, whether you had an injury or an illness, you probably want to get back to doing those things because there's something that gives you joy and like, fulfillment. So um, how do you help people? You are helping by um, developing, improving, maintaining, and restoring those deficits. So sometimes people have an illness, a disability, um, a psychological dysfunction, um, and then it's your job to help them get back to doing what it is that's meaningful to them in their life. Sometimes we take for granted, like, everybody got up this morning and got dressed, and, like, put your own clothes on, brush your own teeth, your own hair, like, did anyone have to help you with that? No, not really not at this age, unless there's something inhibiting you from being able to do that. So things in people's lives um, come up and 
they might have a hard time getting dressed, brushing their teeth, washing their face, and it, age doesn't matter. It, it could happen to anybody. A lot of times we work with um, an older population. If you're in a nursing home, people um, were in a hospital, then they came to a nursing home and you're helping them get back on their feet. Um, but it could be a, a child, a teen, and you'd want to get back to getting yourself dressed because you already know how to do it and you do it all the time. And you, people generally don't want to be needing somebody else to help them do things um, for every, every little thing in their life. So occupational therapy, um, the field of occupational therapy is helping people um, in many different ways. You're not just helping them physically, you're looking at the entire person. So when you go in and you assess the person, you're going to look at their strengths as well as their weaknesses because you want to see where they're strong so that you can use those things as well while you're helping them with that deficit, um, that limitation or weakness to get better. And you would look at so many different things. So if you think that you are good at kind of looking at the big picture of things, but you also are really good at details. Like it's almost like people tend to be one or the other, but you kind of got to be a little bit of both because um, you want to see the big picture, what it is that you want, the goal that you're working towards, but you want to be able to see the little things um, that you need to do to help them. So you would look at everybody's family is different. We all come from different backgrounds. People have different cultures and not everybody approaches things the same way. So people's environment, how their family is, their, their social piece, the cultural piece of their family, you would take a look at that. You would, depending on what setting that you're working in with the, the client or patient, you would, you would look at that. So it's going to be different if, somebody, if you're working with a patient in their home. They have home care where you go to their house directly and you do the therapy with them. People are more comfortable in their house, so you're going to see things, you're going to see how they act probably a little bit differently than if you saw somebody um, at a nursing home or in, an, a, in a hospital setting, because people are not generally wanting to be there. Like They're like, oh, I want to get out of here, or they feel antsy kind of a thing. So there's so many different pieces that you're looking at. You're looking at um, the motor components, like every time you move your body, like you're using like uh, motor skills, you have um, the way that your brain's processing um, things and your, your interactions with others. Um, and then once you assess kind of the whole gamut of what's going on in the outside context of things, you're, all, you're gonna do therapy with that patient. And depending on what the occupational therapist, so since I'm an assistant, the occupational therapist would come in first and that's somebody who went to school for roughly six years so they have a, a bachelor's and sometimes they go to a school that has a bachelor's and master's together so they roll right into the master's you have to have a master's or a phd um, or a clinical doctorate to do occupational therapy they would come they would assess the patient they would say okay this is the problem that they're having and this is their goal they're going to give them a, a long-term big goal and then they're going to give them short goals that they need to meet in order to make that big goal so then I as the assistant would see them and I would look at the big goal know what the big picture is but then we're going to work on the short-term goals so depending on where their deficit is or limitation we might be addressing what they call ADLs which you, you do them every day, you don't even realize. It's activity of daily living. So brushing your teeth, getting dressed, um, grooming, hygiene, things like that. Um, you might be working with a patient or client on those things. Sometimes, depending on the setting, you might be working on IADLs, which are instrument activity of daily livings. Um, and that might be something where somebody's struggling with money management. They are needing help on raising their children, guidance in that department, um, and you would help them with those types of things. <laughs> um, and then um, sometimes people are having problems with rest and sleep. You would address ways that you could help them, uh, maybe bringing in some meditation, finding out, um, Everybody's different too, so you'd want to, once you learn about that patient, once you, I start talking to you, you're going to tell me things that you like and you enjoy. And those things, I can take those pieces of information and I can pull them in and say, oh, okay, like we're going to be working on rest and sleep and you really love this meditation app or this one person who does uh, meditation and I can, I can incorporate or include that. Um, sometimes people um, would have an occupational therapist or an assistant helping them in education. Um, at work, um, play. So play is 
not just for children, but it is the main occupation of children. Like that is their one and only job is play. <laughs> so sometimes when kids are having problems or um, needing assistance, then you would be working on play. Everything you're going to do with them is like through play. Like you can make it, you can make it a play activity. Um, leisure and social participation are two other areas that we address. So there's a lot of components of things that we help you with because it's not just physical. It's your entire person, like inside and out. Because um, I'm sure, like that, you know that if you're not, you need to have the the mental component to um, and be like you want to you want to have good mental health, good physical health. Like if either of those are off balance, then your life is affected, and um, it's our job to help you get back to um, what's meaningful and what's balanced to you, so that you can be your most productive and effective person. Um, I guess I got interested in OTA because I have a couple of other degrees in education and um, speech therapy, but I really really liked audiology, which is to be an ear doctor um, for people who had like hearing aids. But what I really enjoyed was um, students or people that had cochlear implants. It's like when you're when you're deaf and then you get a, an implant in and they attach it to your nerve and then that you can start to hear and there's something. So if you've never been able to hear in your life and then you got an implant, you don't really know what it's like to hear and then to talk is different. It's not the same as it just comes out fluidly for us. So I was interested in that. I wanted to do rehabilitation once people got a cochlear implant. Um, and I just, I once I graduated, I just didn't, um, I went to work at first and I was like, I don't know, like it's a, it's a lot of money and it was a four year, like additional four more years of college. I'm like, I don't know that I could like financially feasibly like make that work so I just was working and then I I was like well I want to be able to do something where I can still help people so I started looking at the programs at BCC and because it was close to home and I knew that I could make that work and then I um, started applying so then that's how I got here I was able to find a program that I could help people achieve some balance in their life because I myself like to have balance in my life so um, Let's see, you can also work in many different settings with uh, OTA, um, such as in a hospital, a nursing home, schools, a rehab clinic. Sometimes you have inpatient, that means you're in a hospital, or outpatient, that means that you traveled from your house or wherever you live to get there to go to therapy, then you leave and go home. Um, mental health um, facilities, um, sometimes there's clinics for people with autism, like sensory clinics, stuff like that. I would say that though, when you graduate, your main um, locations of employment would be a skilled nursing facility or a school. They tend to have the most openings like readily available. Um, there's also home care, if you really enjoy going to people's houses individually, but you would need some experience before you could do that because it's just you entering their house and they need to know that you have what they call service competence, that you're able to effectively do the job before they just like send you to people's houses because there's no supervisor in the other room to be like, hey, can I run this by you? Can I get some help, like feedback? It's, you have to know what you're doing. Um, so like I, she said, I graduated from here and then you, while you're here, you take your classes and then you go out into the field, similar to what you had done, where you have to do um, a clinical rotation. You had to do it at two set places, and um, they were eight weeks long, and that really gives you a lot of hands-on experience. Like, you're gonna be one-on-one -on -one with the patients. You'll always uh, have your, like, the person who's supervising you that works there with you, but um, it really gives you the opportunity to use your skills. And they assess you, you have to pass those as well as you have to pass your classes. Like a 73 is the minimum um, score. So if you didn't have a 73 in your class or your lab, then you would, I guess you would go on probation. They may take you out of the program and you might have to get that up before you can come back in. Um, and then once you graduate, you can sit down for the, hours on end and study for a national exam <laughs> and then and which I suggest you do immediately because you don't want to lose that information um, and then once you're done studying you take that exam and you wait a week and they're like you passed and you're like wow oh, thank god <laughs> so then you um, are able to practice in all 50 states in Puerto Rico but you can't just go out and get a job yet because every state is different in their requirements most states 
if not all states, I don't know because I only apply to Massachusetts and Rhode Island, require a license for that state. So that's really just another like, another fee here, give us some money, we're going to give you a license, that way they can track you, we know who you are, you're a part of our state and you're going to work here. And then you would pay a fee each um, year, every other year, every three years to maintain that license. So like anything, um, especially in a field that's clinical and you're dealing with people and education and there's so much going on and science changes all the time. Like sometimes it's, it's this way and then we find out, oops, it wasn't really that, it's this. So they require you to do continuing ed. Same as if you were a nurse or a teacher, do you guys have continuing ed? Um, yeah, so that just means that while you're working and doing your job, using your skills, you're still kind of taking some classes or doing some education on your own time. Um, sometimes it's even through your job. Some companies offer um, workshops or seminars and that will give you credits. And then you build those credits up and then at the end of a certain time period for NEBCOT, it's every three years, you have to show that you did 36 units. Um, luckily, Massachusetts, well not luckily, but Massachusetts doesn't require any, Rhode Island requires 20. The good part is you can double dip, so if you, you can use part of those 36 for your 20, so it's not like you have to do 50 something. Um, so that's always helpful, and it keeps you fresh, because the more you know, the better you're going to be at doing your job. You can't help people if you learn one thing and you never kind of broaden your horizons. Things change, people change, it's, we're dynamic, so it's great to learn. I know not everyone's always excited about school but it, you the thing about CEUs is it's what you like you don't have to sign up for a class that you're not interested in you go you look around you're like that's something that I'm really like passionate about I want to take extra information on that and learn about it and then you get credit for it too so that's great so um, yeah that's like pretty much what I have to say about OTA <laughs> do you guys have any yep. <laughs> <laughs> Do you folks have any particular questions? Don't hold back. But you can ask separately later on, too. Um, one thing, Stacy. Tell us a little bit about classes here. Do you, do you have classes with all the same people? Do you yep, we're in a cohort, cohort, so there's two different programs, like two different routes you could go into for our, our degree. If you're more um, of a student that's like, I know I'm going to learn best, sitting in a classroom being more hands-on you can do the um the traditional route where you come to class it's a couple days a week and you take the way it worked was like a lot of the students in our class if not all of them they already either had a degree or they had already had all of their gen, gen eds out of the way so math sciences all that other stuff that like is the bulk um so then we would just have the two um two classes at a time sometimes three that we took per semester because it's pretty intense um of a of a program and um then there were other people that chose to do what they have called the online route and some people chose that because they generally just like doing classes online. They're better at self-motivating in that way and like can do things on their own time and, and get it done. Some people do it for convenience. Some people do it because they're, they're working and continue to work and it isn't an option for them to come in during the day, Tuesday and Thursday daytime to like um, take the class. They still do have to come in in person for labs, but not for physical like um, the class por portion. We were here for class and lab in person. So our final panelist is Professor Kelly Hiller. Uh, Professor Hiller is a uh, faculty member here at the college. I have had the luxury of working with her for many, many years now. She's a big supporter of all things STEM. And, um, but she's also a big supporter of how do we get people interested and engaged. And she knows that by hands-on, applied learning, that's the way that people find passion, find things that they're interested in, and many times, being, um, stay engaged in what they're doing. So I always ask her to participate. And so she's actually filling in for us today because normally we like to have a student who came through our program be on the panel. But unfortunately, our student had a family emergency. So Kelly is pitch hitting for us. And so, but she has an incredible wealth of experience and she does a lot of different things. So again, um, feel free to ask her a lot of questions. You've already real found out that she's very approachable. So don't hesitate <laughs> to ask any questions if you have them. So Professor Hiller. <coughs> no joke, I actually used to be the designated hitter in softball. Just <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take a little different approach. I'm going to tell you a story. So I 
am the typical high school kid. I went to a private all-girls Catholic school. I was, you know, goody two-shoes. I was a science geek. I played in the band. I played sports. I did all that stuff. Knew I wanted to do something in healthcare. I wasn't like 100% like, I'm going to be a doctor. I don't know if I want to be a doctor. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I started applying for colleges, and I applied at UMass Dartmouth for uh, biology. So I'm thinking, all right, biology, I can do pre-med, and that way I can, you know, I get all my background stuff, and I'll apply to med school, I'll do my thing. So when we got there, um, I went with my parents, and, you know, we walked out of the campus, we're going, wow, there's a lot of grays down here. And I'm like, I'm not sure I want to be here. So they didn't have a tour big enough. Uh, for, for biology. So they combined me with something called med lab science. I had never heard of it in my entire life. Anybody heard of it before? Before today? Excuse me? Okay, one person. All right. <laughs> so exactly. So other than you, I was just like you guys. So we went in there and I'm like, all right, we'll go into a different building and we're looking through and this big man came out and was like, you want med lab science, not biology. And I kind of went, <laughs> okay, I'm like, this is odd. Um, and he talked to me, completely ignored my parents, ignored the other people in the tour too, but I don't know. Maybe I look like a lab geek, which I clearly am. <laughs> and I was sold. I said, you know what? This sounds awesome. And the reason it sounded awesome is because I'm going, all right, I could be a med lab scientist. I could go work in research, I could work in biotech, I could work in vaccine development, I could, I could go to med school still. I'm like, you know what? This sounds pretty cool. I like the price. You know, because at the time, when I went, eh, you know what, we're not even going to go there. <laughs> we're not going to go with the time. So at that time, I was like, you know what? This sounds like a really cool program with a lot of ways to go. And as you can see, I'm high energy, and I like to be busy, and I like to do things. So I went there. So I completed the program. I was the only resident, everybody else was a commuter, so I was the sole person walking to class, studying by myself, which is not fun, by the way. Um, but I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Every day I was in class, I went, um, last year we went to a clinical. Um, I'll tell you about our program at the end, um, but I wanted to kind of tell you my story. And then I went out and I worked in the field. I worked in my first job, a little tiny hospital, it doesn't even exist on its own anymore. Um, but I worked in all different departments. I'm going to tell you about those two. I promise I won't forget. Mm -hmm. um, and I went through and I was like, you know what? I'm not sure I want to be here. So then I got a job um, at a health center in Boston where 98% of the patients that came through the door were HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Sounds scary, doesn't it, right? But I ended up being able to do some of the coolest testing I did branch DNA analysis for HIV viral loads for the patients that were diagnosed and treated. Um, and I watched patients' viral loads go down to almost non-existent when they were taking their medications. I did flow cytometry looking at actual like markers on cells. I was doing so many cool things. Um, so I did that for a little while, kind of floated around. I went to different labs, worked at the VA for a little while with the veterans. Um, went to do a toxicology laboratory where we did uh, drug screen confirmations using gas chromatography, which was really cool, by the way. Um, got to do a little research and development. Um, then I went up to Brockton Hospital and I started working in the blood bank. And I'm going to explain to you what all this is. Um, ended up being a supervisor there. And I managed um, blood bank and phlebotomy and central processing in the laboratory. And then I found this place. Oh, in the, in the meantime, too, I had, I had children, got a master's degree while I was on maternity leave, that kind of thing. Um, and so I started um, teaching here 11 years ago, phlebotomy, um, while I was working full time. I loved every minute of it. You already heard about phlebotomy. I love, I am the, I need to learn how to use this pen. I want to touch it. I want to touch things and I want to get involved in things. That's how I learn. And I'm like, you know what? I had awesome professors when I was in college that taught me that way. And then I had some that just spoke at me, and I was like, you know, and I wanted to be that person that helps encourage people and high energy, because even those people that don't want to be interested in this are totally looking at me right now, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's, it's like, that wasn't me. Um, so I love the lab, okay? I absolutely love it. I teach here um, full time. I teach nights here. I teach at a Native American institution in North Dakota um, online. Um, I'm a commissioner for the state of Massachusetts, and I have two per diem jobs at local hospitals. So 
and, and I'm in school for my doctorate as well, too. Forgot to mention that. Um, so yes, by the way, when you're complaining about your one subject homework, you can do more than that, I promise. Um, so the laboratory, Amanda already stole my punchline, you know, well not punchline, but you know, 70% anyway. of medical <laughs> you know, uh, decisions are based off of laboratory results. By the way, this is National Medical Laboratory Week, just saying, it so is. happy lab week. Um, so when, when you think about med lab science, okay, what do you think of? And anybody, belt it out, don't be shy, because I'm clearly not. Like Spit something out. You got, yeah, I was going to say, you got this down. You going with a pipette? Yes. All right. So how many of you have had strep throat? So many times. Yeah. How many of you had mono? Ooh, only a couple people. I got it at 31, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I was super excited. How many of you know someone who has cancer? How many of you know someone who has anemia? How many of you have anemia? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, how many of you know someone with diabetes? Heart disease? How they diagnose that? Yeah, people like us, okay? So what happens is, how many of you have had blood, blood drawn? You all so have, by, every single one of you have, because even when you're born, we draw blood. Well, we yeah. use your heel, but, uh, well, Amanda draws blood. Uh, I don't do it anymore other than teaching and occasionally a pitch hitter in the lab when there's a tough stick. Um, where does it go after it's collected? Yeah, well, what lab? Yeah, well, what do we do there? Exactly. So what we do, we have multiple departments, okay? We have hematology. Anybody want to hazard a wild guess as to what hematology is? Anybody know any, what? Close, it's the study of blood cells, okay? So this is the department where we're gonna look at blood, we're gonna look at the cells. This will tell us um, if you are bleeding somewhere and you need a transfusion. This will tell you if you have leukemia, um, lymphoma, um, any type of anemias. I, t I have iron deficiency anemia. Um, lucky me. Woohoo! Um, and so this is the department where we're going to look at those, and that's really where we first pick up a lot of um, the identifiers where something is wrong. So typically speaking, in an emergency room, they're going to draw your blood, they're going to send up. Anybody watch Grey's Anatomy? You're old enough to watch Grey's Anatomy. Has anybody ever watched the first episode where they said, draw the rainbow? You've heard that, and all of you are like, what in the world does that mean? That legit means that the doctors have no idea what's wrong with the patient. So the phlebotomist is going to come in. By the way, surgeons don't draw blood, the phlebotomists do. <laughs> <laughs> they make that dramatic. But drawing the rainbow means drawing every color tube. Y'all have seen those tubes, right? Well, each of those tubes will go to different departments. So we get the little purple top, and that's where we start figuring out what's wrong with the patient. Next is um, chemistry, OK? So chemistry. If you picture something, okay, it's your blood, right, as just liquid, okay? So, like, I don't have anything left in here because the coffee's all gone. But I got water, okay? And maybe this is my blood, right, and I've got cells floating, okay? So everything else that's floating around in that is chemistry, okay? So cholesterol, um, uh, triglycerides, electrolytes. You know, when you drink up your Gatorade, by the way, don't drink Gatorade unless you're, like, sweating it out because you don't need mo more electrolytes. You're, you're good. Um, <laughs> So things like that. So we're going to look at stuff like that. Um, that's going to tell us if someone has a metabolic issue, a liver issue, um, if their vitamin D levels are low, because all of our vitamin D levels are low in New England at this time of year, because we don't get out in the sun. Um, so right. these things, that, and it really helps point the person or the doctor in the right direction. Like, is, are your kidneys failing? Is your liver failing? Things like that. Um, coagulation is usually a part of hematology. Anybody want to guess coagulation? Your blood kind of like clotting. Yeah, right? So it's basically the department that looks at how quickly your blood clumps together and sticks. So when you get a cut, okay, we don't, the machine does it for us now. You say, you know, the machine does it for us. So when you get a cut, eventually it'll stop bleeding, unless you have a bleeding disorder, and then you'll keep going. Okay, so this is the department that looks for that. Because a lot of the times, people don't know there's bleeding problems, and they don't know, and they're like, why do I have bruises all over the place? You know, that's where we would look at that. Um, when we move into microbiology, guess, anybody? Microbiology? Small, 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 yeah, small biology. So this is where we're looking at bacteria. So when you had your throat swab done, that got sent to micro. We're going to do a quick rapid strap um, using immunoassay techniques. Um, it's okay, you'll learn about those eventually. Biology, you'll learn that. Um, 
And so we would look to see quickly to see if strep is positive or not. Group A strep, we care about that one. That's what we're looking for. That's what causes the sore throat and other problems. Um, and then we're going to plate it onto agar plates. Have you seen those at all? You've probably seen them, right? So we're going to streak those onto plates, incubate them, and look at the bacteria that's potentially causing the infection, um, doing sensitivity testing, looking to see what drugs will actually kill that bacteria. We can do parasitology, which is super fun, by the way, looking for different parasites. That's super cool. Um, cooler if you go abroad and do that, by the way, because um, the parasites sites tend to be more endemic um, in other countries. Um, um, anybody see new malaria vaccination development? Super cool. Just right That's there. just been reported out. Um, so things like that. We have other departments um, like transfusion service or immunohematology, also known as blood bank. This is the department that preps all the blood should you be bleeding um, and you get in a big car accident and you lose a lot of blood, you need it replaced. Um, that would be something like that, where we would um, do all the pre-testing to make sure that it's safe for you to get that unit of blood. Um, there's a couple other departments, um, cytology, histology. It's a different route um, where you'd have to go to a different school and, and finish that um, in the end, but that's looking at the cells themselves um, in cytology. Um, and then histology would be where you would get body parts and, and biopsies and you put them into blocks and slice them real thin so the pathologist can look at them. Um, pathologists are the doctors that head the laboratory. Um, you can do these jobs with a two-year degree. That's what we offer here at Bristol, um, where you do your two years here. Um, at, in the last semester, uh, the last two semesters, you'll do seven weeks here in courses every day. And then the last eight weeks of each Sesh, uh, each um, semester, you're in the hospital laboratory. So I did my rotation at St. Anne's Hospital a um, long time ago, and I actually got to even sit in on an autopsy. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. You watch NCIS? Oh, who watches NCIS? You know Abby? Yes. Right? Guess what I she is? She's a she's a med tech. Um, she does a little more testing than the average hospital med tech, but she's totally a med tech. You know, so that's, you know, the simplistic hospital job, but I could go work for Gillette doing quality control. I could go um, work at Celdex down the road from uh, Bristol and Fall River where they do vaccine development, cancer research, things like that. I could do all of that, um, and that's, that's what sold me on this program, where I could do anything I wanted. Um, clearly, I was the kid playing in the basement teaching, so that's ended up how I ended up here. So um, here I teach um, hematology, immunology, urinalysis, um, the phlebotomy courses, um, clinical biochem, um, some intro um, to uh, health, introduction to healthcare, med terms, so I teach all kinds of different things. So I'm still doing multiple things, even just teaching it. So that's why I love it, that's why I do what I do. And every day I think about how many patients I've touched just working in the hospital alone, and then how many students I, I, I stopped counting at a million, because I surpassed that. Like if I started calculating out over the years teaching how many patients I indirectly impacted. Um, because if, if Amanda does her job right in the beginning, and draws the blood correctly <laughs> and identifies the patient and then I do my job right, we diagnose the patient and we can potentially save lives. You know, so we're not the ones up front getting, you know, the heroics like the doctors and the nurses. We're in the background giving them all the information that they need. And I talked a lot, I'm sorry. I do that. <laughs> so I know that you guys said that you don't have panelists that's been through the program here for medical lab science, but you do, me. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. I'm on my pass done. you. <laughs> so it's an incredible program. It's so hands on. The lab in Fall River is is just gorgeous. It's brand new building. The lab is cool. They have you know the they have some instruments, but I actually like the hands on stuff more. Like the chemistry labs are cool. Hematology was awesome. We had we drew each other's blood initially, but she did get some funky slides from people who do have cancers and, you know, blasts and stuff like that. So you do get to see it. And then even urinalysis, you would think like, oh, that's not going to be a cool class. You have no idea what is in your urine. It is fascinating. <laughs> there is crystals there. It's just awesome. And once you start doing the program. <laughs> Not expect to hear today when you walked in. It is, but it's Your true. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs>
specially refrigerated. And, but I, and, I, and I do want to note, too, that all, so we even connect yes. to occupational therapy. And I know it seems like, well, this is weird, phlebotomy, occupational therapy, clinical lab science. But everybody is all connected, and we are all part of that whole that puts that patient back together where they need to be. We get the, the lab stuff, but guess what? A lot of that contributes to what they need to do as occupational therapists because if we can't get the doctor to get those under control, it makes their job harder to do. So we're all connected in healthcare, even when you think we're not. I mean, even down to dental, where you know when you go to the dentist, there's a lot of bacteria in your mouth. There's a lot of mouth abscesses, things like that, that have to involve the laboratory. So you, everybody's connected, and no one sees it out in, you know, when you're choosing careers, no one sees how connected they are. So any questions for Professor Hiller? You will have another 30 minutes with her, so you can ask any questions <laughs> that you would like. Um, just to kind of wrap things up a little bit here, is what, so today was about helping you to understand all those kind of hidden careers that are out there in the healthcare field. These are programs that we offer here at Bristol Community College, and they're jobs that are out there in, Mass, out in Massachusetts, but certainly down here in Southeastern Mass. One of the things is our demographics right now, and this is kind of the boring part, but I just want you to know is that we are looking here in Southeastern Massachusetts that our population is going to get older. By 2035, which seems like a long way away, but it's really not, especially for you folks because you're very young, is that 25% of our population almost is going to be over the age of 65. The need for folks in healthcare field is going to continue to grow. Job opportunities are going to grow. I actually have uh, data. So I looked at all data um, for all the health science careers. Um, and we're looking at they're expected uh, the job market to grow about 20% in the next five to six years in all healthcare fields. There was a long time where people weren't going into healthcare. Right before we developed, we discovered HIV. There was just a disease that was killing people, and they didn't know what it, what it was. They didn't know how you got it. So no one went into healthcare. So there is a very huge divide between the people that are approaching retirement age in the field and then people like me that came in afterwards. Um, so we are seeing more and more job openings every year as these people retire and there's not enough of us to fill the holes. So there are a lot of careers out there um, in phlebotomy and lab. I'm going to assume an OTA, I, I'm not an expert in that field, you'd be able to, to speak to that. So that's expected to grow tremendously. Exactly. So as you go along today, so what we're going to do is we're going to break you guys into two groups now and send you off to do some hands-on activities. But the thing about today is, think about it. Many of you may know, okay, I might be thinking about going into biology for college, and that's great, but I think uh, Kelly gave you some good ideas. Think about all the other ways you can go. Think about what you, how you like to learn. If you go into a straight biology program, most of the time you're gonna still be doing a lot of traditional kind of classes doing the learning, doing preset labs. If that's what you like, if you like delving into the reading and the research, that might be one really good pathway, and it certainly opens you up to a lot of different avenues. But if you are the kind of individual that really likes that hands-on applied work, and even as Kelly was explaining and even as Stacy was talking about, you love solving problems, you love trying to figure out what are the pieces of that puzzle and how do I put them together? These jobs allow you that kind of creativity. And I think that's what people forget about. When you go into the job on a daily basis, you want to be inspired. You want to love what you're doing. So if you're that person that's looking for a challenge, that's looking for how do I solve something, or I want to be helping the community, I want to be helping people, there are numerous pathways into healthcare into sciences that will give you these kinds of opportunities. So I encourage you to explore as much as you can. You are certainly welcome to come over to Bristol at any time. Talk with a lot of our faculty. Professor Hiller is always open to talking. In the back, you, um, she kind of snuck in um, <laughs> later on. But we have Professor Johanna DuPont. She is actually oversees our OTA program here. She's a wealth of information. Um, if you ever wanted more information on any of our programs, just ask Ms. Dar uh, Ms. Uh, Montero to reach out to us and we can connect you with those individuals.